Welcome back to Worth the Effort Woodworking as today we're talking chisels. Probably the most powerful, flexible, and useful tool in your woodworking arsenal. In fact, call me prejudice, I oftentimes will judge other content creators, uh, other shops, even businesses that cater to woodworking really quickly uh, by simply looking at the chisels that they are using. If they are all beat up, damaged, unsharpened, you can tell they haven't been sharpened very often, that tells me quite a bit of information. You see another content creator out there and they have a video on setting up using a chisel. That will tell you a lot about the kind of woodworking they're going to be doing and what you can learn from them. The chisel is kind of a great litmus test. Now today's video, I'm gonna ignore a lot of basics because there are so many other content creators out there that have done it and even I've covered it. In fact, I have several series on woodworking using the chisel and stuff like that where this is the foundation of our lesson, including a prerequisite course, entire series there, and then a start woodworking course that focuses on the interaction of that edge in wood. So we're gonna take it to that sophomore level in this video and we're gonna be discussing how you use chisels wrong. And the first way is exactly how I've been doing it in this entire opening setup, one-handed. If you're using a chisel with just one hand, you're basically using it as a sword stabbing stuff. And more than likely, you're gonna stab yourself eventually because you're gonna be holding a piece of wood and going out like that. A chisel is a two-handed tool. You've heard me say this many times before. Either both hands are on the chisel, working it, working it, working it, working it, or one hand is on the chisel and another handle, it hand is on another tool interacting with the chisel. The only example I can think of is a mallet. If your hands are here, it's very hard for you to end up in an ER due to a chisel accident. Now guys, there are no absolutes in life. I've just told you this is only a two-handed chisel and I know there are people out there that are already typing in the comments that's total BS. He's doing a sophomore level class on the chisel usage and he's telling you you can never use it one hand. Yeah, there are instances when you can do it one hand. If you're using common sense, you know, you're holding a piece of wood down here and you're choking way up on the chisel so that you can add a bevel to it, your thumb's totally out of the side. This is a carving technique. You can do it safely, but I would never teach somebody that who's just starting out. Yes, you can hold it like a knife, uh, like a marking knife, and use it to lay stuff out fairly safely. Once again, I'm not talking to teenagers or brand new woodworkers doing those kind of techniques. There's always exceptions to the rule that you can do safely. You don't have to be a jerk about it, pointing that stuff out in the comments because you feel superior. So there we go. Now we have the safety police and trolls satisfied. Let's now get to the nitty gritty. You have a block of wood, okay? And then we're gonna have a chisel right here. Now, majority of people, when they are thinking about chisel sharpening, kind of the holy grail is to have a perfectly flat edge. We're talking, this is the bevel side, you put it down here, and this is the cutting angle right there, okay? The way you get that is every time you sharpen, you have the edge set at perfect angle and you remove all of this material just to get that to two angles that go on for infinity, two vectors that go on for infinity, okay? The other thing that a lot of people like me do is something called hollow grinding. And that's basically, we go to the grinder and we will position the bed angle so it touches the bevel right in the middle so we can remove material and still have that flat vector, that flat plane right there at the front and the back. And that makes it so you can freehand sharpen fairly quickly. Basically, you can kind of rock those two edges so it goes click, 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 and that finds your angle and then you just maintain that angle. You take a few swipes and that's all it takes. You've now removed just a little bit of material on the front and back. I'll tell you a trick. If you focus on putting more pressure on the rear than the front, you generally kiss that front every now and then. 
you tend to get a sharper edge because you're not pushing down into the grains as hard. You're just kind of skimming over the top. So there we go. That's hollow grinding. Then there are people like me who are very lazy sometimes. And I don't know exactly what this is called, but I call it, call it, call it the lazy grind. I call it that because you don't have to focus on getting the grinder perfectly centered. You don't even really have to worry about any angle. You're just removing material off the heel of the chisel so that you can use a jig of some sort that's going to set the perfect angle for you to sharpen with. And setting up a jig is like 10 seconds at max to do. So it's not that big a deal and it gives you very, very consistent results. Now, back in the old days, I want you to picture this. Great, great, great grandfather. He made his living in a work, country workshop and stuff like that. And he kept all his tools sharp and stuff like that. And he was in his shop. He was sharpening his chisel up. And then he had a massive heart attack, healed over and died. The family felt grieved, grieved, grieved. They didn't want to touch his prize workshop, so they locked it up. Generations go on, go on, go on. Great, great, great grandkids. They look at it as a dusty old shop with antique tools. It's not worth anything. So they let some woodworker come into the shop and just take some tools. And that woodworker takes it back to the shop and he looks at that chisel and he goes, well, that's crap. It's sharpened like this. With a curve. And the, I'm pretty guaranteed that most edges back in the day on a plane or something like that, probably had that. For no other reason than that these people were going to uh, Arkansas stones or soft stones or something like that, and you know, just sharpening it by hand, and that's just kind of the natural way to do it. But it's also how they were using the tool, because could there possibly be benefits to that? So we have a flat grind, we have a hollow grind, we have a lazy grind, and we have a convex grind. Which one of these is wrong? I'm gonna tell you this, all of them are wrong and none of them. Because there's a concept that I don't think is very talked about a lot in the hand tool woodworking realm. Steel is cheap. This is something that came to me because I'm a wood turner and this is my spindle gouge. In production mode, I will go through one, sometimes two of these a year. This blade is well over $100, and I have to make a new handle pretty much every single time. Thanks for great content, because every time I do one of these, I get to make another handle making video. But I will sharpen this thing six or seven times a day when I am in production turning, and that's not just reshape, uh, that's just shaping it. I'm constantly honing it all the time. Every few tops or magic wands in a bowl, making a bowl, I will hone it three or four times. I might go back to the grinder twice. So you just waste away material, but that is still so much cheaper than sandpaper, ER visits, because sharp tools are safe tools. Uh, you know, plus you get better results with a ultra fine edge and I am constantly changing things about the grind for different cuts. I might bring a wing down a little bit to give me a little bit more of a scraping action, that kind of stuff. So this is a disposable tool. This is a consumable. This is a heirloom tool. You will pass this one down through generations. This is its consumable. And if you are using this tool to so much that you use up a blade, congratulations, dude, you're getting a lot of work done. Even if you're messing up and not every now and then have to correct and stuff like that, the fact that you're dulling it that much means you are working well. You're using your tools. Here's something. Here's my previous premium set of chisels. And you know I joke uh, a lot that you don't need to get a full set of chisels, evidence being that it is only mushroomed on one of them and you know sharpening them all the time. But with this being my most used chisel, I want you to look. It's not that much shorter. And I can tell you, I use this daily for five or six years as my main chisel. 
sharpening it two or three times a day and I've only used that much up and this super premium set that I highly cherished was a little over a hundred bucks for one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten chisels back in the day. And here's my current set of premium chisels. I'm still saving up for this one right here. And, you know, I use them all the time. And obviously this one is getting shorter. This is the first one I bought. This is the second one I bought. And I just got this one last year. And you just buy one or two a year. And yet this whole chisel with a handle and everything of the ultimate PMV powdered metal steel is still more than that one turning blank that I have there. I say all this to drive home a point that each one of these can have a different purpose. So there's no reason why you can't change your tool to suit the purpose. Just go to the grinder or sharpening stones right before a specific process that you're gonna be doing and get the tool so that you will get the best results. I mean, how many of y'all have watched a YouTube video and you see some guy maybe clearing out the waste between a dado with his chisel getting nice smooth rhythm. He seems to be doing easy work and you struggle. Well, could it be that that person might know how to set up the tool for that specific task? And they did it right before they turned on the camera. Here's an example I want you to think about. I have a block of wood. It's got a nice crisp edge right there. I want to add a nice little chamfer right there. So I grab my chisel. Bevel is down. I come over. Obviously, I have this angle right here. So it's pushing off. So basically, the edge will clear the wood below where the edge is cutting up there so I won't get tear out on the end. So I come back over, and I'm going to just kind of drag it across. Let me put this hand here. Just drag it across, creating that angle. Notice I'm having a little bit of problem right there. Okay, dragging it across, right like that. For some reason, it is not even, it is not level. So let's look at my edge right here. Oh, I have obviously coarse marks right there and I'm only sharpening the bevel. This is uh, basically a hollow grind. I have a little bit of a shiny spot on the back. So why would it be very hard for me to draw that straight line coming across? Well, could it be? because well, my reference surface isn't straight. So basically I have that wood, that edge coming over here and my chisel has a concave section in the middle to ease my sharpening. But as I'm going over that edge at an angle, the wood is actually coming up in here. So I'm, it's diving down, ramping back out. It's actually changing it, the angle just that little bit, but a little bit over a few inches makes the bevel look like crap. So in that kind of situation, what might be a better bevel to have? I'd say a flat one, so that the wood just rides on it. So I can come down to my certain depth, set my angle, and just maintain that angle all the way across the board. So in this situation, all of these are wrong. Here's another example. You know, you've cut a dado, do you need to clean it up? So you're coming down, you want to clean off the bottom right there. You have all these marks, so you're coming over here, you're kind of wiggling around and sometimes it goes deeper, sometimes it goes sl sl comes out, but it, it always seems you're just, right when you're just clearing the top, all of a sudden it dives down for some, like right there, it just dove down a little bit. Well, what would be a better bevel for this kind of operation? So this time, because we're using the entire width of the bevel, we in effect have a straight edge, even if we have a, uh, a hollow grind out there, because both ends are touching. The problem is that if you get this angle right here, just a degree off as you're freehanding it across the wood, this will dive down, because it will dive a little bit and that increases the angle and you just kind of, uh, you, and you, you kind of, it's rough to do, it doesn't feel right. So of these, which would be the best to do? Well, if you had your grand granddaddy's slightest of curve right here, well, just gliding along it, it would more likely want to come out. So you would get to come in and you would get a smooth action going across grain or with the grain going 
hollowing out the, the bottoms of those kinds of joints. And then you would go back with something like the router plane to make it perfect, which that's what we do. Use a chisel to get rid of the rough work and a finer, more adjustable tool to just get that last little bit perfect. Now, how about chopping? I don't really need to demonstrate that. We've all done some chopping. We are chopping down. Which one of these would be the best angle? I'll tell you which one I do all the time. That one right there. Though I don't necessarily go to the grinder to get that kind of benefit. I would just clip off the nose a little bit steeper. Just like that. Go to, the, go to my sharpening stone, find my ideal angle, lift up a little bit, take one or two stripes, just removing the slightest of material. Why would I do that one? Well, the steeper angle gives me a much more robust edge, so I can, it will stay sharper longer. It starts out a little bit duller, but after that first chop, if you have too steep an angle, it's going to crumble, it's going to break, and it's going to give you even worse results. But if I can have a more durable, steeper angle that will shoot the shaving out quicker instead of curling them back, removing the waste better, that's better. So you modify your tool for the task. And heaven forbid you have to remove this, remove that steeper angle. Well, remember, all you did was take one or two stripes, swipes on the stone. You're just barely seeing that difference, but it makes a world of difference in the results. And it's easily repairable. Just remove a little bit more material because after all, steel is cheap and it is a consumable item. So with that kind of generally brought to your attention, I just want you to think about these stuff. This is sophomore level. We don't need to present everything. You've now gotten a general idea. You know what your hands are doing when the blades go over. So as you're using it, think, is this the best way I could use this tool? Is this the best way I could set up this hand tool? Same thing happens with chisels, scrapers, plain blades, all that kind of stuff. Shoot. How many ways are there to grind a saw, saw tooth? We gr you use a specific edge for a specific purpose. So now let's talk about slope. Yeah, rise over run, that elementary school stuff. Now for those of y'all that you know, might not recollect your middle school and uh, elementary school math, you have rise over run. So if you go over one and up one, we have a point comes up there. If they're equal, rise over run, you probably end up with something like 45 degrees. You come over one and up two, you know, you have an obviously steeper angle. If you overcome over two and up one, a less steeper angle. Now, how does that apply in the real world? Well, if you have a mountain that's fairly steep, we all know when you're skiing down a mountain, if you point your skis down and just turn when everything's getting in the way, you have a very steep slope you are going to go very, very fast. But if you were to go across a mountain like that, your path is a lot longer, so the slope is a lot less. If this distance right here to here is a lot longer, your slope is going to be less. Well, how do, how do we use those kind of angles in woodworking? Well, you will always hear woodworkers when they are talking about sharpening, talking about the angles they are, the lower or the higher slope of the tool that they are using. You know, you have the bottom of a chisel, we have our bevel right here, and it comes out over there. A lot of people, this angle right here for just a normal bench chisel, they are sh shooting for about 25 degrees. If you're really anal about it, you'll go 27 and a half degrees, 0.34 or something like that. It just, you can get, you can take this way too far. Uh, for a mortising chisel, something that has a very steep, uh, that needs to take a lot of abuse on this edge right here, you'll do a slightly steeper angle because as we said earlier, steeper angles are more durable. Now, you don't have to have the whole bevel at that one. As I said earlier, you can just clip the very end at the angle you want and it will serve the same purpose. The lower you bring this angle down, I know a lot of people that work in pine, they like to have like a 20 degree angle because it's not very hard wood. And that lower angle means that you don't have to push as hard through the wood in order to make a cut. When you have very, very steep angles, 
but something, you know, like this right here will cut all day long. In fact, it'll be a very durable edge, but you're gonna to have to push it through the wood, wood harder versus something that is like right here. You know, you can get down to the thinness of aluminum foil. Aluminum foil will cut, but that edge is going to crumble really fast because there's not a lot of meat behind it to support it. But can we, as intelligent woodworkers, take a tool, a chisel that we have sharpened at a specific angle and make the tool or the wood think it's at a different angle. Well, if you have a chisel and you're using it, a lot of people, when they use a chisel, they're just going to push straight through. They're going to push straight through. Well, the attack, the angle of attack of the wood against that is whatever the bevel angle is. So if you have a 45 degree bevel angle, I know it's pretty extreme. Well, that wood is just going to be traveling straight up this distance right here. But if you were to turn that at a straight angle and you're pushing the wood, the tool across like this, well, look at the angle of attack to the wood. That line is a lot longer than this one. And as we just explained, the longer line will represent a lower slope angle. So the wood will actually think that this blade is a lot lower a slope than what it actually is. In fact, if you were to come over here and come in at this angle, you could theoretically have an edge as like 10 degrees or something like that and just kind of slowly work through a project. But how can you push a chisel through wood at that angle? Well, that comes around to hand positions. It's basically creating a pivot point. So you're actually not going to work through wood in a straight line. You're gonna work through the wood in an arc. Now, I will use these types of techniques a lot of times whenever I'm like flushing up uh, dowels or pegs or flushing two pieces of wood together like on dovetails. You know, if you cut them a little bit proud so you can cut back a little bit, a lot of time you're going into end grain. And as we discussed earlier when we chopping, you don't want that edge to crumble as it works through harder wood like end grains. We're going straight across end grains. So I can have a very steep angle on my edge by taking those few strokes, but if I could somehow approach that end grain in a slicing action going across the bevel, it reduces it to make it easier to get through the wood. But to do that one, a lot of times I don't go straight, I pivot through the wood. So here we go. I just put a, a white oak dowel into a piece of pine. So we have very soft wood, very hard wood, and the hard wood we need to cut across the end grain. Now I could come over here and try and push it through, but that's, White looks pretty hard. I'm going to definitely dull, damage or dull my edge. And uh, frankly, that's a little bit thick to do that right now. I could use a mallet to do that one, but I'm just, in this example, I am hanging off the edge. A lot of times I'm not, I'm having to do it like this right here, coming through. So the idea of what I want to do is create some kind of pivot point so I can take the, the blade and come across. So that's where you use two hands. I'm going to be using my fingers to press down to keep it flat and a finger pretty close to the edge to be my pivot point. And then I can just move the back of the handle across that edge using the corner. And you can slowly work through some really tough wood, this particular one being too big. And you can see I'm getting through it in a slicing manner. Now, obviously, if it's this big, the first thing I would generally do is bring it down some, and that's where I would turn my chisel over. So I'm going to show you something about working a chisel upside down, which will actually make your life harder. So I'm going to come over here, and a lot of times on square pegs, if I want it to extend up, but I want to pillow the edges so they're more durable and it looks cool, I would take my chisel, I'll come down to the bottom, and I'll kind of pivot off of the corner, and that's how I can pivot. I can create a little chamfer right there on the corner of a square peg. You've seen me do that in various videos. I like doing it that way because the edge makes it pretty polished. So I don't have to do anything else. But the problem is, look back here. 
Can you see what I just did to the wood itself? I've compressed the, those fibers. I've dented the wood. Now in harder woods, you won't see that visually. I doubt you would even feel it. But whenever you put finish on it, that will uh, stand out because those crushed fibers will absorb oil more than the fibers around it and you will see it. This is something I first learned about in wood turning because a lot of times when I was first starting out reactor, this is kind of intermediate after I've been doing it a few years, I would be turning like the inside of the bowls or I would doing, be doing a scraping cut on the outside and I would get it visually perfect. I would sand the interior and all that kind of stuff. Uh, you couldn't feel any change in the curvature. I'd come around here. But then whenever I put oil in it, all of a sudden you would see these complete circles going all the way around. What was happening is the bevel of my tool, I was rubbing it like I should. But if you think about it, you have your wood, you have your back of the chisel, front of the chisel, working through the wood, and you're putting some downward pressure on this side, so it's rotating out. This becomes a pivot point right there. And that is a point the way most people sharpen their tools. So you can create a lot of pressure, even though it doesn't feel like much at your fingertips, but you've got a lot of leverage right there. And it's using the wood itself that you're going through to exert pressure right here. So all that gets magnified right there and you dent, you crush fibers in the wood, but it's so minute, you probably won't feel it, even though you've sanded the top, but they will absorb oil more. How do we get around that? Well, it's, one of the, it's like we were talking about earlier. Steel is cheap. Modify your tools. If you're doing that kind of situation, why not when you're sharpening your chisel, you're going boom, 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 how about lowering it down as slow as you can, just taking a swoop right there? What would that do? That would round over this back so that there's not a single point touching the wood and you can spread that force over a little bit larger piece of wood and likely not damage it. Could that also be why great-grandfather had their chisels with that curve right there? Because they were limited in the tools where they're doing, and a lot of times they would flatten entire boards with their chisel, and they didn't want to rock that buff bevel and damage the wood. So back to this little peg. I'm gonna turn my chisel over using both hands. I'm just going to kind of get rid of a lot of the waste first. Using my front hand as downward pressure, the back hand to provide propulsion, and this is hard work, pushing through straight across like that but I'm not trying to be delicate here. And then whenever I get closer and closer to the end, I can switch it over either up like this and using my palm right here to create the pivot point and downward pressure and coming across sideways to give myself nice control and then lower the angle. And also that gives you just a better cut. You'll get a better finish off the tool. Do the same exact thing right here, though I'm not sure if I can grab any wood, but see, I'm coming across it. I'm pivoting off my fingers. But probably the most common time I use that kind of technique is when I'm working tenon cheeks. All of us have done this. You cut the tenon and cheek on a power tool, hand tool, or something like that, and you just need to make some fine adjustments to get it perfectly. Well, if you were to take your chisel and just drive it down, well, it depends upon if the grain is going down or up, what kind of shaving you're gonna get. If it's coming up this way, you're gonna make a very nice, clean cut, but it's going to split off. If it's coming down this way, it's gonna split down sometimes. A lot of experts will tell you, well, don't worry about any of that. Score this line right here, so you severed the fibers, and work sideways across. So you're theoretically splitting wood because you're not really concerned about the looks of it. Well, here's another option. If you were to take your hand and position it, you can kind of start at whatever low point is and flatten it out there and just arc it down. And if you arc it one way, you're going 
with the grain going up this way. If you arc it the other way, you're going with this way. So you can actually use a chisel with the grain to get a good surface, which will give you an even better bond. But more importantly, it kind of slows the process down and gives you more control. So instead of coming straight across the thing, I'm kind of arcing a corner until I can create a huge swath like that and make life a lot easier for myself. So all those basic techniques that we've been doing for your entire woodworking career, you know, chopping straight down, planing all the way across, splitting stuff out. Well, if you step back and think about it, apply the knowledge you want, apply how maybe you might be able to position your hands to do different things with your chisel, arcing instead of pushing through, slicing with the corners instead of using the entire edge, that kind of stuff. You can manipulate the interaction of the wood with your tool. So in effect, those basics are wrong because you now have the knowledge to do it better another way. So that begs the question, with this ideas that I'm just introducing to you, you can go down a deep rabbit hole in thinking about how can my hands manipulate this tool so that the edge works better with the fibers that's being presented. I mean, there's so much this tool can do that you haven't unlocked with just the basics that we teach you for splitting, slicing, planing, and scraping. Well, I hope that you enjoyed this video and at least it gets you thinking. Sophomore level, junior, uh, senior level stuff, it's not designed to spoon feed you stuff. It's designed to present you information and let you think about it so you can apply it in different ways with maybe tools other than a chisel. But either way, I hope you learned something, picked up a few tips and stuff like that. But in the end, remember, it's always worth the effort to learn, maybe create new ways of using your tools, and share those ideas with others. Be safe, have fun.